Uh, on to this now, South Africa continuing, of course, to record high numbers of COVID-19 cases. This while the world continues to grapple with various parts of this ongoing battle against pandemic. Health experts and scientists always looking at ways to stay ahead of this virus. And that just remains complex. Let's talk more now uh, with, the professor, with Professor Adrian Purin from the NICD, of course, known to our viewers here at ENCA. Prof, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, before we look at uh, the latest numbers and the latest developments, because um, as we've spoken over the last year and a half, it's a really a moving target, this coronavirus, isn't it? Uh, there's more and more talk um, about the need to get ahead of this thing, to talk about the next potential outbreak, the next global pandemic. Um, um, uh, uh, even though the mind boggles to try and think about that. And talk of a pan-coronavirus vaccine. Now, uh, you're of the opinion that this is amongst the holy grail of, of vaccines. Are we, as we grapple with the fight against this uh, current virus, um, are we any close to perhaps unlocking a pan-coronavirus vaccine? Well, thank you very much for, for the opportunity and good evening to your, your viewers. So, yes, it, it's one of the steps, I think, in, in terms of how to um, either protect ourselves from future outbreaks or our current outbreaks, for example. It's thought that um, at least coronaviruses, as we know, have been here for a long time. The common cold is um, certainly caused by some of the coronaviruses. The more serious coronaviruses are the ones that we, we're struggling with right, right now. And it's thought that, for example, one of the um, influenza pandemics, I think, in the 19th century was thought to be a coronavirus, not really an influenza virus. Oh. So, yes, that's a, a, a really key area is really to find, if you like, that vaccine that will really cover a range of viruses. And the same has been for influenza, for example, um, HIV. Again, there's been various attempts in, uh, to try and reach that particular point. It's really an in interesting strategy. It's a complex strategy, and there are multiple strategies within that mm -hmm. to try and have this vaccine that will protect not only against what is currently in circulation, but perhaps even for future um, outbreaks, for example. So, yes, there have been some, I think, some initial studies um, in the United States and, and, and elsewhere, but just tried to demonstrate, at least in animal models, uh, these particular types of approaches to try and target through looking at uh, what they call conserved areas, for example, mm -hmm. or multiple areas, rather than just the spike protein, which is, as you know, has been the focus um, of the current vaccines. Um, so, yes, that, that, that is one uh, strategy, if you like. But there are multiple other strategies currently as well. Um, if, for example, not only focusing on pan vaccines, but also refining our current vaccines. The, it's an astounding feat still <clears throat> that we have had a vaccine within less than a year. And these vaccines were approved and they've been proved to be safe and effective. But of course, there are refinements around mm. this particular vaccine. So for example, they approaches for intranasal vaccines, um, where it's thought that that may be a better target, a, bit, a better approach. So yes, the vaccine field will, will constantly evolve to try and, and get us ahead to reach that level of protection that we really need or at least try and limit uh, transmission and variance as, as best possible. I suppose the one positive is that now that we've lived through what we've lived through so far, um, the uh, funding won't be hard to come by for people doing this kind of work. But what are some of the, uh, the bigger obstacles of trying to find a, a pan-coronavirus vaccine? I would think that it would be very difficult to trial and test for something that doesn't exist as yet. Absolutely. And I think that was the same with um, Ebola vaccines, for example. Again, you can't run these particular trials. So it's really in particular settings or the design in which you would then implement um, your vaccine strategy to determine whether or not your, your vaccine is effective. So I think the Ebola vaccine experiences may have well given us some mode or modus operandi as to how we can assess the, the efficacy of those, those types of viruses. But I think I'm um, certainly... And I know that there, there probably are objections to, to some of these approaches. But, for example, vaccines go through animal phase trials, for example. So, again, those may well give us some clues um, as to whether or not in the future, whether or not um, these particular vaccines will, will be, be effective. But you, you raise an important point. Um so where do we find ourselves now? Um, here in Gauteng, it seems that we've, gone, we've gotten through the peak of the um, third wave, and unfortunately that is now really um, hitting KwaZulu-Natal and the Western Cape really badly as we see their numbers surge. But at the same time, that battle continues. We now have the battle of trying to get as many South Africans as possible 
vaccinated. Uh, if we look at how vaccinations have impacted those battling the pandemic abroad, what are the learnings we can take from that? I think of the UK, who of course had high numbers of people vaccinated. Um, they still having a high number of people being infected, new cases being reported, but a low number of those cases ending up in hospital and ending up in unfortunate death. Um, who can we learn from uh, in, in terms of those countries that are further along this current journey? Yes, sir, I think very importantly, you've, you've raised the UK. The United States is another good example where, as you know, they had a really, a, really a, a very good example of how to roll out your vaccine program. But you've, that it's also a good example of when things stall. In other words, if you um, do not have programs that are supported or, and reach uh, the largest numbers of possible people in the context of a variant that is so transmissible, um, then things can stall and you can go and have a reverse. And I think Israel has been another good example again, mm. where there's been really great um, experiences around the vaccine. But again, certainly in the context of the variants, that, that's really been uh, a good example of the, the, the difficulties that we, we still approach. So, and the recognition, I think, as well, that the vaccines may not always prevent all um, infections and, mm. and disease. So but it does prevent serious disease, hospitalizations and death. And I think we've seen that in our own country with the uh, recent Sizonki results, for example, mm. where the J&J has certainly been shown to be, be quite effective. So I think there are multiple learnings and, and approaches and the importance of actually um, managing programs and making sure that they're up to scale and reach as many people as possible in order for us um, to prevent the, the serious diseases affecting our hospitals and, mm. and, and death as well. And of course, variants are going to be really critical. I think a few months back, perhaps many people thought variants, why bother with those? But that's mm. now become the key focus for us is really to understand these variants, how they're changing, what are the implica implications for that, and continuously monitoring for those particular variants. Because we've seen when we had the, the beta variant being so mm. dominant in South Africa, and now the delta variant is the worldwide dominant variant, what else can we expect? You know, is this virus going to be evolving to the point where it becomes even more pathogenic, more transmissible, making our vaccine challenges even uh, more challenging than, than they currently are? And yet in the face of all of that evidence and all of the hard work being done by people such as yourself, your colleagues, and of course our frontline workers, you have uh, stories like we saw um, of that protest happening outside uh, one of our most important hospitals in Cape Town over the weekend. If I could just ask you before I, I let you go, um, how do you feel when you see stories like that where people, and yes, people have pointed out, look, this is a small grouping of people, they're anti-vaxxers, uh, they're looking for attention, but those scenes were pretty ugly, uh, in my uh, opinion. How does it make you feel after you've done so much work in uh, just your research and, of course, becoming one of the faces and voices of the National Institute of Communicable Diseases to try and make sure that people always have the correct and factual information in front of them? How do, how do stories like that leave you feeling at this stage in our ongoing battle? Yeah, it, it is disconcerting, but I, as you know, the, the history of... Um vaccine hesitancy has been with us for centuries, in, in fact. But I think what has changed now is really the, the role of media, um, the social media in particular, in those particular mm. contexts. That, that, those, that can be really a powerful influence. And so I think there are multiple strands and approaches. Um, so we need a, a vaccine-positive approach, in other words, rather than a vaccine-hesitancy mm. approach. Um, and I think that that will really try and target where we need to focus on and how to address it. In fact, um, in the UK, in the United, uh, United States, it's really called a uh, national security event, in other words. Mm. So we really need to approach this from a very broad, high level, and then get into the specifics. Not a matter of um, symmetrical discussions about whether vaccines are good or not. It's how to manage why is it that this vaccine hesitancy is there? What do we, how do we address that and the communities that are affected or influenced by it? So I think it's a multiple a stage, multi-sectoral approach that we need to, to adopt. I don't think it's, we need to be defensive, but as I said, I like the word, you need a vaccine-positive approach positive. Um, to this particular concern. I like that. I like that as well. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. Professor Adrian Purin is the head um, of the Center of HIV and STIs um, at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases.